Good morning, and welcome to the North Shore Unitarian Church, where our mission is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. My name is Sunny Wachowski, and I'm serving as your Sunday service associate today. What I love about this community is the opportunity to serve, to grow, to use our many talents. And um, starting off, uh, we have a busy congregation with many things going on. Please note the announcements in your order of service and perhaps on the screen. Um, Yasha would like to tell us, tell you about something. Our, our church relies on Barry. Barry who's like this and the rest of us who are like this. He's so thoughtful. Anyway, good morning. My name is Yasha Ramsey, a member of the church. And the reason I'm carrying this is not because I've fallen down and can't get up. Still got a year or two left of me, I think. I wanted to show you that coming up, your very exciting Christmas concert, uh, both our wonderful choir, our music director, and some special guests will be Amal and the Night Visitors. And the story of Amal is one of those timeless Christmas stories where um, compassion, heartwarming, um, loving, uh, gold, and all those kinds of good things, uh, and always love wins out in the end. So Amal is a, a poverty-stricken little boy living in a village with his mum, not a penny between them, but the villagers are all kind. And one night... There's a beautiful star in the sky and knocking at the door. And when Amal opens it, the wonders of the world outside his village are revealed. You must buy tickets, because I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we have, sitting over there with his beloved Sue, we have one of our former members of Amal, and I have a video of him with his skirt lifted up to his knees, dashing after one of the kings, and I'm planning to put it on YouTube unless he buys a whole block of tickets. <laughs> so the practical part is, it is the 15th and 16th of December, the Saturday and Sunday, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on, on Saturday, 3 on Sunday, because of our service, and uh, tickets available from choir members or from the church. Uh, please do come out. I know it's in the afternoon and the magic of evening will be hard to um, create, but the magic of Christmas is always there. And you'll know about the crutch when you come to see it. Thank you. And another announcement. As he's done the last two years, John Slattery will be selling white poppies to go with your red ones or not after church today. They're worn as a reminder that war produces civilian casualties as well as military ones. And that peaceful solutions should always be pursued over military ones. He will be selling these in the foyer for $2 each. Any surplus after expenses will be given to the church. I'd also like to welcome newcomers. Uh, you're invited for coffee in the foyer after the service. We're glad you're here, everyone. I'd particularly like to give an extra welcome to newcomers and visitors who might be with us today. If you'd like to learn more about our community, I'd encourage you to sign in with your contact information on, in the iPad in the foyer. If you have any questions about our congregation or Unitarian Universalist tradition, our Connections Coordinator Ariel and, or any of our friendly volunteers wearing greeter buttons uh, would be happy to chat with you. After the service, I'd like to invite everyone from longtime members to first-time visitors to socialize and perhaps share coffee. Okay, in this community, we celebrate people from all walks of life. No matter how you make your living or how you experience the sacred, no matter who you are or who you love, we hope you will feel welcome here. Now, in a slightly unusual circumstance, um, I was to introduce Arthur Berman for our Canvas testimonial. Um, he is a lifetime, lifelong member since 2000 and is a, an affiliated community minister with the North Shore Church and is married to the lovely Andrea Berman. Um, he's unable to be here in person today. However, he joins us uh, via a voice memo. So we'll all, and he'll explain his absence. So this is Arthur Berman. Good morning. 
I'm sorry I can't be with you today in person, but I've got a bad case of bursitis that has rendered me bedridden, and I did not want to have Andrea read a manuscript because what I have to say this morning is very personal. I could talk to you this morning about the importance of our movement and its place in the world, especially in these troubled times, but that's not what I'm going to do today. I could also talk to you about the important programs in our church that are excellent and deserve to be well funded, but I'm also not going to do that today. In March, the last time I had a formal role in a service with you, I was being poisoned. My own body was poisoning me because my kidneys had failed and I did not realize the extent of how badly they had failed when I was with you. One of the side effects of kidney failure is hallucinations, delusions, and basically having an altered sense of reality. And that is where I was the last time I saw you. And certainly what you experienced must have been troubling. It was for me. Instead of complaining that you didn't get the usual level of worship that you have come to expect, I hope, from me and this church in general. Instead, I got an outpouring of concern and reassurance from both people I knew well and some I didn't know so well also. This community rallied around me and for months people were asking me, as they still do, how I'm doing and what's going on in my life. I can assure you that after three or four runs of dialysis, my personality, for better or for worse, came back. But I was taught an important lesson, which is what I wanted to speak about briefly today. That is the role of our community for one another. We have built a wonderful place of mutual caring, one that can't be duplicated in this world very easily. And that is my testimonial today. A place like ours does need a physical place to exist within. That place needs heat, it needs good ministry, it needs good programming, and it needs a philosophical and religious framework which we provide. But without you, the people here, it would not be. But it does need the practical things that we have in the canvas and we wish to support. And I will be supporting the church as I do every year with a different feeling, understanding what it is like to receive this love in a way I never have before. And I wish I could be there in person to thank you as I had intended. But this recording I hope will do, and I hope does inspire you to pledge until it feels good. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? So these words are by Karen G. Johnston. She's a minister at the Unitarian Society in New Jersey. Do not be alone right now. Gather together. Gathering together grows courage in ourselves and in others who see the numbers swelling. It is a small thing, but right now it is an important thing. Great sources of wisdom remind us, just because you cannot stem the tide of all hate, it is still right to do the thing you can do. These things add up. Your one thing and my one thing, his one thing and their one thing and her one thing. Together, it becomes a big thing. Do not be alone right now. Any liberation, all liberation, is collective liberation. My freedom is bound with yours and yours with mine, inextricably. Let us together cast our lots doing this big thing, bending the mark, moral arc of the universe towards justice. As a young person growing up in Golden, BC, in an immigrant family, 
I was a very proud Canadian. I learned that Canada was a welcoming multicultural society that stood for democracy and human rights. Wearing the red jacket, maple leaf on my chest, with Canada in big block white letters across my back became a dream. Earning that jacket and competing in volleyball for Canada at the World Championships in 89, the World Junior Championships, was a highlight of my young life. Fast forward to 2013. My understanding of my country's history was about to be shattered. I was serving on the board for Elliott Institute. We were investigating Canadian locations for Elliott summer camp. One site that had possibilities was the Chequemist Centre, formerly known as the North Van Outdoor School. In order to experience the accommodations, the food, the natural beauty of the centre, I attended a weekend retreat at Chequemist hosted by Kairos, a social justice oriented organization that unites Canadian churches and religious organizations. The theme of the weekend was centered on reconciliation. Kairos brought in prominent indigenous activists who broadened our awareness of indigenous issues. Following this retreat, some months later, I attended the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Edmonton. During this time, I was immersed in the lived history of residential schools. I came to know the term settler and wrestled with guilt and shame that goes along with my privileged position with the colonizers. I learned about the systemic racism of the Canadian government towards the Indigenous peoples of Canada, the legacy of intergenerational trauma from these schools, and how much work needs to be done to undo these systemic inequalities. My image of Canada was as a benevolent multicultural society was forever changed. I am now quite conflicted about celebrating Canada Day. And while my new understanding of Canada's colonial history brings discomfort, I am glad that I am more aware of the truth so that I can be a part of creating a more equitable Canada today. And so I dedicate the lighting of our flaming chalice to the growth that comes from asking and considering uncomfortable questions. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. Bring us peace. I was eight or nine when I first remember thinking, I wish I had been born a boy. It was not because I wanted to be a boy. It was because at that young age, I already knew that boys had access to power, freedom, and choices that I would never have as a girl. Adventure, achievement, and power were the realm of men. Jacques Cousteau, Marlon Perkins, Evil Knievel, and the Crazy Canucks. They all had what I wanted, to be able to explore the world, conquer physical challenges, and obtain the fame and fortune that came with it. The result of this realization was that I began to systemically cut myself off from the feminine aspects of my nature and adopt more masculine traits. I became more focused on competing in sports and at school. I chose friends who were sporty, academically oriented, and competitive. I took every opportunity to challenge my skills against boys, believing that comp comparing myself to girls was pointless. I was 13 when I wa started wanting the attention of boys. I learned through trial and error that there was a very fine balance I needed to achieve, attracting enough attention to be noticed, not so much that I would be harassed or demeaned. I needed to dress, groom, and act within a narrow band of acceptability. My teachers, family members, friends of my parents, and parents of my friends all took it upon themselves to offer their judgments, criticisms, and warnings about what I wore, how I did my care, how I made up my face. My education and grooming was relentless. I was 17 when I was made brutally aware that attracting the wrong kind of att male attention could get me killed. 
That was the year that a very dear friend of mine was murdered two blocks from my home. And three doors from her own. She was coming home on the bus late at night, the same bus she took every weekday, the same bus I took every week, the same stop that was closest to both our homes. She had been attending a cheerleading practice. She was followed off the bus by a man whose attention she had attracted, the wrong kind of attention. My father drove me to school the next morning before I had learned of Jennifer's death. As we drove by her street, I saw police cars and people standing around. I was curious about what had happened, but I was confident it would not be anything serious. It was between second and third period at school that I found out about Jennifer's death. I collapsed at my locker in grief and shock. How could this be? As we gathered to mourn Jennifer's death, the air was filled with laments. If only she had been on a different bus. If only she had not been so pretty. If only she had known self-defense. If only. No one ever said, if only he hadn't. Over the next few years, I set out to achieve all that I could. I was accepted into a prestigious engineering program at UBC and graduated in the top quarter of my class. I worked at the world's biggest construction site for two summers as a student engineer. Upon graduation, I successfully competed with men for a coveted job as an engineer in a large construction company, and I was on track to become a manager of a department there. Yet, when I was 24, I realized that I was incredibly unhappy, and this realization shocked me. I was where I thought I had wanted to be, and yet I had never felt so alone and empty. I've slowly pieced together the reasons why. Every day in my job as an engineer, I was reminded in subtle and unsubtle ways that I was different, that I was the first and only female engineer that had ever been hired by the company, that I would be the test case to decide if they would ever hire another one. In the field during site inspections, I was belittled and harassed. At site meetings, I had to sit in trailers with walls lined with pictures of naked women and try not to feel small and vulnerable. In the office, I was the outsider and found it almost impossible to relate to the middle-aged men that I was being groomed to manage one day. For so long, I had cut myself off from a huge part of who I was in order to achieve my career goals. I had denied myself the freedom of self-expression about who I was how I felt about things, and what mattered to me. And because I worked in a male-dominated field, I had few opportunities to create nurturing and supportive friendships with other women. Ultimately, I believe the main reason I was so unhappy was the reality that access to power and privilege does not bring happiness, especially when it comes at the cost of the energy, self-denial, and diligence required to play the game by which I mean shrugging off sexist comments, laughing at sexist jokes, dressing appropriately, and sucking it up when I felt upset or shaken. I want to be clear, I do not blame men for this. I do not blame them for my experiences. We all live in a culture that grants privileges to people who are white, have more masculine traits, such as competitiveness, rationality, and individualism, who are cisgendered and heterosexual. Any of us who do not naturally fit in these categories have the choice of either forcing our behavior to conform to these norms or experiencing less access to privilege and power. Privilege is not something we take and it is not something we can give back. It is an unlearned advantage that we gain, unearned advantage, that we gain because we are a member of a specific social group. These advantages come at a cost to those who are not members of the dominant group. For example, privileges that white people have that come at a cost to people of color include role models that look like us, having an uncomplicated relationship with the police, and having my voice carry more weight in almost any social setting. Not having gender privilege 
dominated the formative years of my life. More recently, a car accident eight years ago left me with an invisible dis disability that, among other things, prevents me from working and limits my capacity to participate in social gatherings. And I do hold privilege in many other ways, including race, I am white, sexual orientation, I am heterosexual, economic, I am upper middle class, and education, I have a master's degree. All of us ex here experience privilege in many dimensions of our identities, and at the same time, do not have privilege in some areas. I want you to take a minute and think back to your earliest memories of having to censor yourself to avoid criticism. Perhaps you remember when you were a child and adults told you to be quiet, stop squirming, or stop crying. Perhaps you were bullied as a child and needed to change how you behaved or what you wore to stop the bullying. Perhaps you grew up poor and you might remember a time where you tried to keep this from your friends. What do these memories tell you about your access to privilege? What do they tell you about the experiences of others who lack privilege? There are many cultural beliefs and norms that teach us how to behave in order to maintain the privilege hierarchy and ensure the comfort of those who hold the most privilege. Our ability to maintain this comfort can be a matter of life and death, as is the case of my friend Jennifer and so many young African-American males. So adopting these behaviors becomes vital. And they exact an enormous cost to our integrity, our relationships, and our well-being. One of the most entrenched myths in our culture is the belief in meritocracy. When we hold privilege, particularly socioeconomic privilege, we tell ourselves that we have worked hard for what we have. I certainly worked hard to obtain a degree in engineering, and I worked hard to learn and become competent in my job. But have I worked harder than most of the people who have less than I do? Have I worked harder than Alamar, who worked the night shift with my son from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m., then went to his second job as a cleaner for another eight hours? Then on weekends, he worked a third job, all to pay for rent on a small apartment and food to feed his family. Can any of us honestly say we work harder than he does? Systemic privilege forces us all into a line, from those with the most privilege at one end to those with the least privilege at the other. As we look up the line to those with more privilege, we may feel envious less than, and sometimes even morally superior to those ahead of us. As we look behind us in line, we may feel guilt, pity, and sometimes even disdain. Our place in line correlates with our ability to mobilize resources to get what we want. Whether what we want is as simple as feeding our family and keeping them safe, or as lofty as getting a seat on the Supreme Court of the United States. However, our place in line does not correlate with happiness. While those near the front of the line have easier access to the things that can help us be ha happy and healthy, it can still be elusive. In fact, many people who hold significant privilege are very unhappy. Privilege is tricky this way. Being in a line creates isolation and separation. So much of our unconscious energy goes to assessing where we fit in this line when we are in a group. Once we find our place in line, we moderate our behaviors to ensure the comfort of those above us. This activity can be exhausting and disconnecting, coming at a high cost to ourselves and our relationship with others in the group. It maintains separation and prevents the kind of deep and meaningful relationships that we all long for. In addition, the line prevents us from having relationships with people who occupy a very different place than we do. 
A lack of relationships across privilege leads to discomfort when you meet someone who obviously has less privilege than you do, such as someone of a different race. This discomfort usually arises because we do not know what to say or how to relate to someone whose lived experience is very different from our own. And we are concerned that something we say might not be received the way we intended. I want to share an experience I had that showed me how unaware I was of the impact of me being white, the impact that me being white had on other people. I was attending a retreat on diversity and social justice in California. It was the first time that I was in a group in North America where white people were not the majority. Because I have some awareness that in multiracial groups, white people tend to do most of the talking, I promised myself that I would not speak up too much. I kept repeating in my head, don't talk too much, don't talk too much. And yet, on the first day of the retreat, the very first day, I spoke up three times in the morning sessions. As the evening session started, we were asked to think up ideas for an improv skit. My hand shot up in the air, and I was the first person called upon by the leaders. The next person to raise her hand was Emily, a woman of Bolivian heritage. She described her idea, and then she turned to me and said, and Kathy, I am so effing tired of hearing you speak. Effing white people take up so much space. Can't you just learn to step back? I am sick of hearing from you. This went on for several minutes. I was mortified. I wanted to slink away and curl up somewhere private to soothe my ego. I had done the very thing I had told myself not to do. Fortunately, this experience occurred within a community that could hold each of us with compassion. For about 10 minutes, I received empathy support from one of the trainers. Once both Emily and I had settled a bit, the whole community gathered around us while Emily expressed all of the heartache and pain she has experienced regarding white people dominating conversations. She shared her despair about all the wise, thoughtful voices of people of color that are never heard when white people are present. As she spoke, I realized that I too was missing out on hearing these voices and learning what I had come to the retreat to learn. It was a beautifully transformative experience for me when I finally understood how my participation resulted in the silencing of so many. I finally understood fully the loss to me of this silencing and how much my actions did not reflect my values. There are two reasons why this experience ended up being meaningful and instructive instead of painful and divisive. The first reason is that it occurred within a community committed to dismantling systemic privilege and holding each other with compassion in the process. The second reason was that I was willing to listen and reflect back what I heard from Emily without defensiveness or shame. I was willing to step into strategic discomfort to learn the impact of my actions and therefore have the opportunity to do things differently in the future. This is how magic can happen. In order to create change, those of us with more privilege must be willing to listen and understand the impact of our actions on those with less privilege. We must be able to hear what is being said without defensiveness or denial. We must be willing to step into this discomfort so that one day we can realize our Unitarian value of justice, equity, and compassion in all human relationships. This is the new front line of the civil rights movement. This is what the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements are asking of us. This is challenging and scary work, which requires the support and companionship of others committed to dismantling privilege and where better to find that support we need than within this Unitarian community. We are a community of seekers committed to accepting and accompanying each other in our spiritual growth and also committed to social justice both within and beyond our congregation. So how do we move forward? How do we turn this line that we are all forced into 
into an interconnected web of life? How do we create a world where eight-year-old me would not have to choose between being true to myself and being successful? We need to start by being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Building our resilience to learn painful truths about how our Im actions impact others. We need to be willing to make mistakes and have those mistakes brought to our attention so that we can learn. We must identify where we hold privilege and steward our privilege to create systems that truly represent justice and equity for all. We can embrace consensus decision-making processes, create spaces for voices that are rarely heard, and acknowledge that we are all immersed in a culture that treats certain people better than others. We must hold each other accountable with compassion as we slowly unlearn the beliefs and habits that maintain differences in privilege. This is the work we are called to. This is how we show up with courage, compassion, and conviction to achieve the goal of beloved community for all. These closing words are an excerpt from a poem by Jeannie Shiro, Senior Minister, First Universalist Church, Denver, Colorado. Let the only burning be the fire of commitment in our hearts, minds, hands, spirits, in our community of faith. Live solidarity, use your voice, demand justice, better live it into being. Cry out for others to join you, name hate as hate without shrinking back, without letting embarrassment or false humility or resistance or apologies for white skin get in the way. Direct all that energy to action, standing with, speaking out. Be impassioned. Be indignant about the violence ending of so many black lives. Precious, precious, precious lives. Be outraged about the burning of houses of worship, sanctuaries of the spirit, sacred communal spaces. Be awakened. Racism is alive. It will never die of old age, ancient though it is. Rather, it must be buried by human awakening to equity incarnate. Demand action from those in power, the press, government, and everywhere. There is no safe place from which to simply observe. All are already involved. Listen more often than speaking. Speak more often than being silent when your words or actions could change the world even just a bit in the flesh in real time. <clears throat>